Hello and welcome to Vox Videos, a series of short videos highlighting topical policy research issues. I'm Viv Davis from the Centre for Economic Policy Research and I'm in London for the launch of a new CEPR report on cross-border banking in Europe, implications for financial stability and macroeconomic policy. Cross-border banking played a pivotal role in the recent global financial crisis and so understanding how it works, its costs and its benefits is extremely important and particularly now as we're witnessing how sovereign risk and banking risk are becoming so dangerously intertwined. Were the cross-border banks the cause of the crisis? Or was the cause more to do with the failure of the regulatory system in dealing with the multinational banks in an efficient way? And what about issues such as effective bank resolution and the call for a European-wide regulatory framework? These are some of the questions we'll try to address in this short Vox video. I think cross-border banking was central to the crisis, actually. I think that the macro economy and flows from China were the backdrop, but the core issue was the risk concentrations that the firms were holding, and particularly in RMBS, retail mortgage-backed securities, and other types of structured products. So some banks were holding 50 to 70 billion in their treasury operations. So I would say that international banking, and particularly risk transparency within the firms, identifying concentrations, identifying the size of the risks being held, was a, an absolutely central part of it you should have about 33% exposure to the US. It appears uh, that uh, European banks have collectively 47% to the US, so more than 14% more than according to the portfolio weight. And it's exactly why the European banks had such large losses uh, to the US. Uh, the, the subprime crisis which started in the US in the Asian bank had far less losses. To what extent would you say that the lack of an appropriate resolution framework actually prevented supervisors and regulators from responding effectively to the crisis? So exactly, we would argue it's not necessarily the cross-border banks themselves that caused the crisis, but rather the lack of the appropriate regulatory uh, response to the failure, the weaknesses in several of these large banks. And regulators had the problem that they didn't have the right framework in place, both on the national as well as on the cross-border level. On the national level, Regulators in most European countries were left with two choices. Either liquidate a bank according to corporate insolvency, which in the case of Lehman Brothers, where the US authorities decided to just send Lehman Brothers into the regular uh, insolvency process. The other option, and that was the option that it was taken in most cases, especially in the case of large banks and in the case of cross-border banks, was to just bail them out by giving all kind of guarantees, by injecting equity in different forms in the banks, but that, of course, has the downside that it uh, basically um, uh, gave benefits, gave rewards to the aggressive risk-taking, to bad behavior by the banks in the years previous to the crisis. So it created what we economists called moral hazard. It gave incentives to renewed risk-taking in going forward after the crisis. It's very difficult to have cross-border banks and you want to have European or global financial stability and still trying at the national level to influence the banks. And this trilemma is saying uh, you have to make a choice of two objectives, not three. And then, of course, we want uh, to have European financial stability, so either we keep cross-border banks with the single market or uh, we keep national sovereignty, but basically we would go to national banks. To what extent did the lack of an appropriate resolution framework prevent regulators and supervisors from reacting in an effective way during the crisis? There isn't at the moment a solution to resolution of a large bank that does not involve public funds. And one of the big questions going forward is whether with um, living wills, recovery and resolution plans, with bail-in structures, whether going forward it might be possible to develop a regime that did enable a large bank to be resolved without causing a lot of grief for the markets uh, without public sector funding. But that's still a huge question mark, I think.
we have to do supervision, resolution, deposit insurance at the European level to keep a stable banking system. Do you think we need a central European regulatory authority? Can you actually move away from individual regulators supervising on a day-to-day -day basis individual firms? I just think you couldn't actually. Uh, um, and the reason for that is that it is national governments that at the moment have to uh, deal with the bank in difficulty. And so handing over all the responsibility to a single agency, I just can't see happening at the moment. The monetary policy at least should have a look at financial stability take it into account. In addition, we may need extra instruments like a loan to value ratio to constrain uh, a housing boom uh, or higher haircuts on the stock market if equity prices are uh, rising too fast. But monetary policy cannot turn a blind eye to financial stability. And basically, we need a new type of central bankers, not only macro trained, but also having knowledge about the financial system. Monetary policy has to be complemented by macroprudential policy. Um, the European Central Bank sets interest rates for the whole euro area, but it might not be the ideal level for all countries. Uh, what is good for Germany might not be good for Spain. Now, obviously, the, the, given that we have a one single financial market, the European Central Bank cannot set different uh, uh, interest rates for different countries. So the additional tool of having macroprudential uh, regulation to fight, for example, uh, against asset bubbles in certain countries, uh, to fight against credit booms uh, in certain countries is an additional important policy tool. Mostly it has to be applied on the national level, but it definitely has to be monitored on the European level to make sure that uh, um, uh, there's a consistent framework throughout uh, the Euro area and throughout the European Union. The issue that the firms face is the problem caused by a multitude of different regulatory regimes. And particularly if you look at liquidity and liquidity reporting, which is immensely complicated. The FSA has moved first and putting in place the FSA returns has been very, very difficult for the firms. And the, the share problem is caused by a firm across 15 markets being faced with 15 regimes or a firm across 50 markets having 50 regimes. Now, if you look at Europe, I think what the European Banking Authority is hoping to do is to create much more harmonization in the rules and hopefully a single reporting framework. So the same bank isn't reporting different numbers in different countries to a different template on sovereign debt. Uh, we all know by now that sovereign debt is not risk-free, as uh, e even though the, the Basel framework still claims so for OECD countries. Um, but that there are different uh, uh, risk weights to be attached to debt of different countries, and that should be also reflected, of course, in the, in the accounting rules. A second step from this would be to have a bankruptcy uh, regime in place for sovereigns and the, the, the place to start is basically the European Union, um, which would both improve ex ante and ex post efficiency of this, this model, because it would uh, force investors to properly price the risk they take when buying riskier um, uh, uh, sovereign debt, and it would be also ex post and efficiency improvement because it would make uh, the resolution of a situation such as in Greece right now much easier because the framework would be in place. And finally, in your opinion, what do you think the implications would be for the banking system in Europe if there was a sovereign default, for example, as potentially could be in Greece? I mean, it's hard to predict, but I would not see a similar shock as with the Lehman Brothers shock because I think the, the, there has been much more preparation for such an event. However, it would be still a very messy event and there would be contagion effects. And I think this uh, leads us back to mistakes made in the previous years. If there had been much more honest and open stress testing, for example, to finding out what would be the, the, the result of a sovereign default, for example, then we would be in a much better position today to judge that and also a much better position to address that.
how the regulators manage the transition phase to these much tighter requirements, how they encourage the banks to put in uh, much better risk management systems. And I have to say, whatever you do on capital, whatever you do on liquidity, and whatever you do on resolution, in the final event, what makes a difference is how the banks actually manage their risks themselves. So I think it does come down to the quality of risk management the risk appetite setting, clear transparency of risks within the firms. And the Basel Committee is trying to get all regulators to tighten their approach to risk assessment overarching, to the way that they look at risk management structures in the firms. But that at the moment is very unequal. And I, I do think the biggest challenge is how do you really make the system safer and sounder?